God is good all the time. Talking about spotting the truth from a lie, our planet is shrinking. Now, that doesn't mean that there was something on the news that said, you know, the actual circumference of the globe is getting smaller. Uh, but we have been in the jet age for 50 years, right? Anywhere you want to go, uh, you can get there and you can go. And when you cross the globe, you get to meet new people with what? New ideas, new ways of seeing things. So uh, you don't just live in your little isolated community anymore. Also, there's this thing, I don't know if you've heard about it yet or not, but it's called the internet. I actually got a phone call Friday. An older gentleman, he is retired, and he used to teach at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. And he called, and he wanted to talk about my article in Friday's paper, and we were on the phone at least 20 minutes. And so I, I mentioned something. He said, well, I couldn't find your all's church in the phone book. I said, well, if you go to the website, computer, I don't have a computer in my house, so uh, there's the one person I've talked to in the last 10 years that, that didn't have a computer or didn't have access to the internet. But we've got the internet now, and so everything is going faster and faster. Things are changing. So we live in a world where we've got the greatest flow of information we've ever had. You know, there's probably some people that don't believe this, but if you're sick, Rodney, did you know you can go on WebMD? No, no. no. <laughs> exactly, I can self-diagnose myself. <laughs> you don't believe in WebMD? Move on to the next one. But we've got the greatest flow of information we've ever had, and so, uh, we also, our culture is changing. We live in a shrinking world. This isn't the world of uh, growing up and everything stayed like it did in the days of Leave It to Beaver. Things are changing. And so there's a challenge to that. It's hard to keep up with new information. It's hard to keep up with the things that are changing. And it's also hard to know, how do I choose? I have all these options, all these different truths that are coming at me. Constantly, How do I go through that? So there's all these choices. I remember as a kid, when you wanted a car, what was there? Ford, Chrysler, or Chevy. And that was it. And now you turn on the television, and there's commercials for car companies you can't even pronounce anymore. How am I supposed to do that? Um, do I want to use a Macintosh? Or do I want to stick with my PC? I have more choices than I ever, ever had. And also, in the midst of all these choices, I think I'm losing the roots that we have of community. Do I want to live in a rural area? Do I want to live in a big city? Do I want to go and live in a bedroom community? You know, do I want to live outside the big city? Your kids are facing that. Some of them, as they go off to college, where will I graduate? Where will I come back to? It doesn't matter though, no matter where we live, the globe, the planet, the community, things are shrinking. And in that is a challenge. We live in the middle of many competing stories that are trying to convince us this is what reality is really like. For example, we have people that believe that all that there is to this world is this world. Uh, Carl Sagan, the great PBS scientist, right? He said, all that is and all that ever was and all that ever will be is the universe. Then, I think we have a different perspective. There is more to reality than what I can see, taste, touch, smell, feel. I believe in a supernatural reality. Amidst these competing stories, we're going to argue over our origins. Where do people come from? Which is correct, creationism or Darwinism? Uh, is there meaning to this world? Or is everything pointless? Is everything meaningless? Well, America right now is involved in global efforts across the world to try to help and spread our view of what? Democracy, freedom freedom to vote, but that's not the only story that's out there. On top of that, we've got to face the idea of the four B's, 
right? You know what those are, don't you? You studied up on that before you got here, right? What gives purpose to life? What, what gives life meaning? The four B's. Is, is the world's view correct that it's all about beauty, brains, bucks, or brawn? Is that what makes you a man? Is that what makes you complete as a woman? Is this what it means to be successful? To be more beautiful, to be more wealthy, to be stronger, to be smarter? Is that what it is, or is it what Jesus says? Seek first the kingdom, and then what? All these things will what? Be added to you. Mary Poppins. I remember my parents taking me to see Mary Poppins when I was Gunner's age. And we went to the Tivoli Theater in Downers Grove. And it was this big, ornate, old theater with like the red velvet curtains that would close and all the columns and everything. Man, I was fascinated. What do kids get to see today? Hangover. Not just part one. Not just part two. Part three. So now we have a culture that says what happens in Vegas, what? Stays in Vegas. When I was a kid, we watched Mayberry. I was disgusted to hear that Modern Family, I've never watched it, so I can't judge it. I was disgusted to find out that last year or the year before, that was the number one television show. What is that? The Emmys or the Globe Awards, whatever. The television award show. Number one show in America, right? We've got competing stories among Christians. Do we have liberty or license? What, what does freedom in Christ mean? Is grace my ticket to live with no consequences? I live under the grace of God, so that means I can do whatever I want, whenever I want, however I want, and I have no consequences? What does it mean to have freedom from sin? When I look in the scripture and Paul says that I'm no longer under the law and I'm free, I'm not under bondage, what does that mean? Does that mean I'm free to just sin and to live however I want? Or does that mean I'm, I'm free from the grasp of sin? And then there's this idea that says, let me just stay at home. I won't have a television in the house. I won't read anything. I'm going to hide from all temptations that are out there. And somehow that suddenly makes me holy. If I can just remove myself from the culture around me, remove myself from temptations, isolate myself, be wholly different, is that what makes me holy? Well, turn to Colossians chapter 2, and let's look at what this means as we. Paul says to walk as we received Christ. Look at Colossians 2, and let's start with verses 6 through 7. Paul writes, Therefore, as you received Christ the Lord, so walk in Him, rooted and built up in Him, established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. So, how did we receive Christ? Paul says, I want you to walk, I want you to continue, I want you to follow Him just as you received Him. Well, first of all, Think of what Jesus says before he goes back. At the end of Matthew's Gospel, before he is going to go back into heaven, what we would typically call uh, the Great Commission. Think about that for a moment. Jesus, you know the story. Uh, when Jesus says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth, therefore go and make disciples, right? So make disciples of all the nations, uh, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Spirit, teaching them all I commanded you to go on with you. What's the cycle there? Paul says, I want you to continue in Christ just as you received him. Well, how did I receive him? Someone discipled me. Someone took the time to teach me the basic elemental principles of Christianity, to teach me about Adam and Eve in the garden. They fell. Sin entered the world. To talk about the coming of the Messiah, to talk about Jesus' ministry, to talk about his death on the cross, right? to talk about what it means to be a Christian, to talk about the second coming, to talk about all of those things. There's a cycle there. And Paul says, here's how you got into it. I want you to continue in that. It's part of being in a community, not isolated. I want you to be together with each other. 
learning and growing and teaching each other. When you first became a Christian, tell me I'm wrong, but you were eagerly trying to learn more, weren't you? I was. I couldn't get enough of my Bible. I wanted to spend time with other believers. I had a lot of anticipation. I was very optimistic. I was very hopeful. God is doing something wonderful in my life and in the life of my family, and I couldn't get enough of it. Can you look yourself in the mirror and say, yeah, that's how I feel about my faith? Paul saying that's how I want you to feel. I want you to continue in your faith just as you received Christ. And how did you receive him? That this was the best thing that ever happened to me. And I had room to grow. I don't know about you. I didn't come up out of the water knowing everything. That took me about six months. <laughs> At the end of six months, I already knew it all. And I didn't need any more, right? Man, Paul said, I want you to walk, to continue, to follow Christ just as you received him. How would you receive him? You came up out of that water eager, and you knew that you had room to grow. When you came out of the baptismal, you came up and you said, man, I want to eat this stuff up. I want to grow in my faith. I want to grow in my knowledge. Tom Eddins, one of my favorite professors at Harding, taught Old Testament. He was crazy. He would come in, and he had these dark sunglasses on because he suffered from migraines all the time. And um, he would come in, and he dressed really casual, and he was really relaxing. And he'd come in the classroom, and he'd sit in a chair, and he'd throw his, his feet up on the table. And he'd sit back, and he always had a big cup of coffee. And it took him a while to not be so grouchy when he first came in because he, he suffered from these headaches and these migraines. But man, the first day of class, I'll never forget it. I wrote it down in the middle of my Bible. First day of class, he's teaching Old Testament survey. It was 1996. And he said, the greatest enemy of learning is the illusion of knowledge. The thing that gets in the way most of me learning and my growth is thinking I already know everything there is to know. Does that make sense? If I think I already know everything, if I don't have any more room to grow in my faith and in my knowledge, that's going to hinder me. I'll never forget that. I also had purpose. Paul says, I want you to walk just like you received Christ. I craved growth. I had purpose. There was something substantial about my faith, about being in a community of believers that gave me a purpose. And we are either growing or we are coasting. You are either becoming more mature, more knowledgeable, more like Christ, practicing the ways of Jesus, looking more like him, you're either growing in that or you're declining in that. There is no static place. There is no plateau that you get to and you say, okay, I can now shelf my Bible. I can now put off making my church uh, life a priority. I can just kind of coast now. Right? I hit that plateau. I'm in good shape with God and I don't need any more. You are either on a trajectory of growth or you are falling down. And most importantly, look again at the passage. It has to do with trust. As you receive the, uh, Jesus the Lord, walk in Him. Rooted and built up in Him. Established in the faith. Just as you were taught. Abounding in thanksgiving. It was in Him. I trusted in God to make me righteous. Not the things I could do. Not the things I couldn't do. It wasn't about me. When I came up out of that water, it was focused on him. Dallas Willard, if you've never read anything by Dallas Willard, his best book is The Divine Conspiracy. He uh, recently passed away from a brain cancer. Dallas Willard said, grace is opposed to earning, not effort. I can't earn God's love. I can't earn grace. Then it's no longer a gift. Grace is opposed to earning. But there's still effort there. I still put one foot in front of the other, and I still strive to grow in my faith. Is Christianity an anti-intellectual faith? Look at Colossians 2, verse 8. Paul says, See to it that no one takes you captive by uh, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world and not according to Christ. I have heard people say, 
because of this verse that Christians should not study things of the world. Never read psychology. Uh, don't read about things like evolution. Don't stay away from the world because Paul is anti-philosophy, anti-thinking. Don't learn. Don't think. What is the philosophy that Paul is rejecting here? What is it that he says, don't be taken captive by? It's an empty, worldly type of philosophy. And in fact, to be able to analyze, Paul is saying, there are philosophies that are empty. For me to be able to analyze them, to reject, and to choose the right one would require what? The ability to use logic, reason, thinking. What, what is the root of philosophy? What does philosophy mean? If you break down the etymology of the word. Lover of wisdom. Philosophy, philo, love, sophie, wisdom. Lover of wisdom. Seems to me like there is a book in the Bible that a really powerful, rich king wrote. Might have been David's son. What was that book? Proverbs. Oh, yeah. What's Proverbs say about wisdom? A lot. A lot. About learning wisdom, valuing wisdom, holding on to wisdom. So the Bible is not anti-intellectual. I've got to be able to spot the truth from a lie. I am in a shrinking world. I am bombarded by competing stories. So what's the modern day equivalent? Paul is looking at some empty philosophies that have to deal with if you can abstain from the world, if you can follow the right rituals. Well, look at Colossians 2, look at verse 16. Let no one pass judgment on you with questions of food and drink or with regard to festival or new moon or Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come. Let no one disqualify you, he'll say later on. What's a modern day equivalent for us? When your kids go off to college and sometimes in high school, they are going to face the idea of humanism. Humanism is just that idea that the pinnacle, the best, of all of the universe are humans, and we can do it all. We don't need any help from anything supernatural. Relativism, what's true for you is not true for me. Have you ever heard that before? Well, that might be true for you, but that's not true for me. That's the idea of relativism. It's, it's relative to your culture, to your location. If you grew up in the Middle East, you know you would have been a Muslim. If you grew up in Asia, you know you would have been Hindu, right? That's what relativism teaches. There is no absolute truth. Of course, that's kind of self-defeating because if to say there is no absolute truth is to say something that you want people to believe is what? True. So you just said there is no truth. Is that true? Do I believe you? If you don't think that there's a problem with relativism, talk to young people. And then finally, Darwinism. There's, there is a big threat. It's taught in school that you come from what? A monkey? I've been to the family reunion. Never mind. Let me put that off to the side. I'm not going to say that there aren't things in evolution that aren't true. Uh, I believe that Dobermans come from what kind of dogs? Rottweilers, right? We can, we can do a lot of microevolution and see that to be true. But the idea of pure Darwinism that life came from nothing, it's random chance, and there is no creator. That's a challenge to us. So let me wrap this up. Our direction determines more than our intention. Paul says, keep walking. You, you may have good intentions. You may say, I want to be a believer. I, 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 you know, I want to go. Where do I want to go when I die? Heaven, yeah. Who wants to go there, right? Maybe not today. Maybe you're not ready to go today. But that's where we all want to go. I have good intentions of getting there. But what path am I on? Am I still walking in the path which I received Christ? I could say one thing, but the actions I portray really reveal what's on the heart. And I think from this passage, I need to be able to train my thinking skills so that I'm not captured by some empty philosophy, some empty idea of what it means to be spiritual and what it means to get into the end. That's strong language to me. Paul could have said, don't be swayed. 
you know, don't be manipulated. Capture, that's like held hostage. Look at the emptiness that Paul talks about in verse 8 when he says, um, See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit. But what's he compare that with? The fullness of Christ, beginning in verse 9. In Jesus, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. In him, you have been filled. He is the head of all ruler and authority. Uh, so he has all the fullness of deity. We've been completely filled with him. Of course, verse 12 is really important. Where he talks about, uh, we were buried with him in baptism. In which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God. Um, who raised him from the dead. So there is an emptiness out there. He contrasts that with the fullness of God. And I believe that the threat of competing stories is faced best by recalibrating, replenishing, resisting, and remembering. If you've ever worked with tools before, uh, measuring tools, um, for example, in construction, we use a, an instrument that you look through. It's called a transit. Right? You've seen surveyors on the side of the road, right? And you're like, these guys are in the way, and I just want to drive faster, right? They're, well, if these guys weren't laying the elevations and, and the parameters, you wouldn't have a road. These guys are out there right away. In concrete, we use those. It's called a transit. Every once in a while, you'll think that you're shooting level, and off to your left, you'll set a benchmark, a grade, spin to the right, you set it again, but then you find out one is four inches higher than the other. What happened? This teleoptic transit thing I'm looking through, it needs to be recalibrated. It needs to be retooled, readjusted. That happens for you and I with our perspective. Every once in a while, I need to be recalibrated. Replenishing, I need to be refilled with the truths of Christianity. Because my faith and my knowledge is like a sieve. And everything that pours into me eventually pours out. I need to learn how to resist. Paul says, resist these empty philosophies are going to take a captive. But then I need to remember, what is it that Paul draws us to at the end? He's going to draw us back to the death, back to the burial, uh, back to the resurrection of Jesus. So if I want to continue to walk, I'm going to remember how I came into faith and the excitement, and I want to build on that. I want to constantly be the type of person who is refilling myself with the goodness of God.